Hello, everybody, and welcome to our December 2017 Hangout. Uh, my name is Jim Pingle, and this month we'll be talking about dynamic routing with FRR. Uh, this month we'll be talking uh, about well, our project news, as always, we'll start out with. Uh, we'll ask, uh, why would you want to use a routing protocol? Uh, we'll go over some routing protocol terminology, uh, give a little bit of an intro to BGP and then OSPF. Uh, talk about, you know, compare and contrast BGP and OSPF a little bit, why you'd want to use one or the other. Uh, we'll go over uh, what the FRR, what FRR is uh, and a uh, little bit of an intro to that and then how, uh, how that package works on PFSense. Uh, we'll talk about configuring FRR and its uh, Zebra component. And then we'll talk about uh, BGP setup preparation and configuration and then OSPF setup preparation and configuration. And then converting from OpenBGP to FRR and converting from Quagga to FRR. Okay, uh, for project news this month, um, well, we didn't have a Hangout last month, so we're kind of playing a little catch up here. Uh, we had our 242 release and also 242 release P1 and 235 release P1. Uh, primarily security and bug fixes, uh, some features in there on 242. Um, uh, you can check out the blog and that I've linked there and the previous release blog post as well. Uh, if you're if you're not on those latest releases yet, you want to make sure you get updated to those ASAP. Uh, make sure everything's current. Uh, we have an article up on Snort, an open app ID for application detection uh, that we that we put up. Uh, and our, our documentation on the wiki has been beefed up a little bit in the last couple of months, so uh, check that out too. Uh, Nikki, uh, we were at the uh, DPDK Summit, uh, FDIO Mini Summit, and AWS reInvent conferences um, for a variety of different things we're, we're checking out. Uh, we announced our new NetGate products, uh, Tensor and Scalar. Uh, they're based off of VPP from FDIO for a data plane, uh, but we may also support NetMap in the future. Uh, it's based on VPP because it's capable of performance far beyond the previous year Linux kernel networking. Uh, it's just blazingly fast. Um, currently using Linux as a base OS to run VPP in our, in our Tensor uh, setup at the moment. Uh, so far we've tested it with uh, 40 plus gigabit per second IPsec. Uh, and some very very impressive numbers all around with it. It's just it's just a beast. Uh, we got um, the Tensor product is high throughput, enterprise focused. Uh, Scalar is uh, small medium business. Uh, Tensor is going to be focused on the CLI, and Scalar will have a web interface as well as a CLI. Uh, it's all hooked back through a REST conf API, so you'll be, you'll be able to hook that into your uh, orchestration management uh, of choice. And uh, the first thing we're going to have out is uh, for Tensor is uh, AWS Transit VPC. So if you have uh, uh, different instances running in VPC in different regions, a Transit VPC will connect your your instances in those regions together uh, at uh, super high bandwidth between them. If you need if you need to communicate between the regions uh, with any kind of speed, and that's going to be a, a pretty fun thing to deal with there. It's a pretty in pretty uh, interesting thing we'll be getting into. Um, so uh, we also posted a little sneak peek of our upcoming C3000 based platform, platform called the PLCCB. Uh, there's a, a link there on Twitter that's got some pictures of, or uh, screenshots of the GUI running on it. Uh, it's a C3000 CPU. It's got a built-in switch. Uh, the exact specs, I don't think they're set in stone yet. We've got a couple different models we're looking at. Um, so the, also our NetGate office is moving. Uh, if you're doing anything as far as, you know, placing new orders, doing RMAs, anything like that, uh, next month, I think the middle of next, ne next month, the, the office is going to be moving. We're trying to do everything we can to minimize any kind of delay or anything, disruption in lead times and deliveries. But uh, there may be a little hiccup or two here, to, depending on what happens, but uh, minor, if anything. But you know, just keep that in mind. If you're going to order a system next month, you might want to do a little bit earlier in the month to avoid uh, anything that might happen in the middle. Okay, um, before we get into anything, I do want to mention a few uh, little disclaimers here. Uh, I am going to be going very light on detail in, in a few areas. Uh, we don't really have the time to get into all the intricacies of how the protocols work, advanced setups. You know, I'm not going to be teaching you every last bit about BGP or OSPF um, because we're, you know, we're trying to keep the focus on, free, on PFSense here. Um, so some terminology and examples that I use are going to be simplified. Um, so, you know, I may say, well, you can't do this. Well, it may not necessarily never be possible, but <laughs> I'm going to have to leave some things out to, for simplicity's sake. So if you're really familiar with BGP and OSPF, you'll probably find some things I either omitted or maybe some slight contradictions I'm making just for the sake of simplicity. Um, I'll try to, you know, 
say, well, you really could do this if you do that, but you know, we really don't have time to get into all the advanced configurations because uh, even in the GUI, there's many more advanced configurations that you, could, that you can do uh, than we're going to cover today. Uh, and then there's a lot more that's possible beyond that in the protocols themselves and FRR uh, that we just don't, we, we weren't going to have time to get into. So we're not going to talk about anything like multiple areas, uh, route maps or communities, access lists, prefix lists, things like that, or in ways that you control and manipulate routing and, and uh, how things get summarized or uh, decisions made, things like that. We're not, we're gonna, not going to get too deep into that stuff, if at all. So first up, if you haven't used a routing protocol before, you don't may not know why you need to use one. So, uh, so why would you want to use a routing protocol? Well, the first and most important point, it's easier than maintaining static routes. Um, so if, with the routing protocol, every router knows about the networks that it's connected to, and then it will tell its peers about those networks. So rather than having to go on every router you've got, so you've got a, a, a dozen routers, and every router has like three subnets, Anytime you set up a static route, if you add a route to one router or add a network to one router, you'd have to go around to every other router you've got, add a new static route, put it to that new router, <laughs> and it's just a big mess. Whereas with the routing protocol, you just reconfigure the routing protocol on that one box to add its route, and boom, it will announce to all its peers that, hey, I've got this network, and you're done. So it's a lot, it, a lot easier to maintain. It scales better for larger networks versus a manual configuration. Uh, you can react dynamically to events. So if you've got multiple paths or multiple WANs, uh, or if you've got your peer set up in like a rings kind of topology or a mesh, uh, if some segment goes down, uh, your your routing protocol can pick a new path. It may be a longer path, may not be des as desirable, but it can still get there. So um, your routing protocols will generally fall into two classes. Uh, IGP, which is interior gateway protocol, uh, will manage routes between internal segments of a single network. Um, so you might have OSPF between two local segments, site-to-site uh, -site links. Your OSPF stuff might be like between a router and a layer three switch with a bunch of stuff. Um, or you could have BGP between uh, you know, two internal routers, things like that for IBGP. Uh, you could have EBG EGP, which is exterior gateway protocol, which is routing between discrete networks or different networks. Uh, you've got uh, BGP, you know, normally like between your site or an organization and your internet provider or a peer of some sort that's outside of your organization. So uh, before I get too deep into BGP or OSPF, there's a few terms I want to lay out because I'll use these when describing certain aspects of things and, and I, I don't want to just throw them out there without telling you what they mean first. Um, first off, we'll have an autonomous system, or AS, which is basically just a fancy way of saying you, your organization's network. Typically, an autonomous system would comprise an entire uh, company, or at the very least, an entire site. Um, a, a particular, a one site would not necessarily ever have more than one AS number, and, and in most cases, it's very rare for that to happen, and some BGP implementations don't even support more than one AS for an organization. So. Uh, so you'd have everything internal in there. Um, so an AS number, uh, which I was just kind of talking about, it's just an, a number assigned to your autonomous system. Uh, generally, you'll see this in BGP. Um, and where you get that number depends on what type it is. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when I get to BGP. So, and depending on your peers' capabilities, it could either be a two-byte AS, which is from 0 to 65,534, uh, or it could be a four-byte. AS number, uh, which is you know up to a gazillion there, <laughs> uh, so it's a 32-bit number uh, uh, unsigned. So it's a pretty pretty large range there. Uh, so uh, that's a pretty big range you could have for an AS number. Although the seeing the larger ones, at least you know most people doing local stuff wouldn't use them in that high range. Although there are reserved ranges of both uh, areas, uh, the two byte and the four byte area, if you for for private use. So um, when you're talking, in, and that's more, more specific to BGP. Now, an area is sort of a specific notation for OSPF, and it's just a set of related routers or, an, or a segment of a network. Uh, and you're going to see an area represented as an IPv4 address in dotted quad notation. So you have like 0.0.0.0, .0, .0, .0, and that's the most commonly used area. It's just area 0. 
um, but it could be any IP address that you want. Uh, it could be maybe a subnet ID for a particular location, or it could just be 0001, 0002, you know, whatever you want. Um, we're only going to be concerned with one area today, and I'm just going to make that area zero. Although in OSPF, you could have multiple areas, and they could be notated with whatever numbers you want, so long as you know in your, in your design, you know how you laid that out. Just keep them in dotted quad notation. Uh, we'll have router IDs that we're talking about. It's just a number that's uniquely identifying a router. Uh, again, typically noted as a dotted quad, like an IPv4 address, like usually it's your LAN address of the firewall, but it could be any IPv4 address. It doesn't even have to exist, so long as it's unique to your router. Um, so you just don't want to have two uh, devices with the same router ID anywhere in your dynamic routing setup. So a neighbor is just a peer in a directly connected network that's running the same routing protocol. So you're running BGP, your neighbor runs BGP, you're directly connected in a segment, you're talking to each other, they're your neighbors. So you're, you're right next door to each other. Um, you're running OSPF, you're just, you're both on the same local network segment talking to OSPF to each other. Uh, and so you're just, your neighbors, you know, directly connected. You're basically gateways for each other, for your, for each other's networks. Uh, you have an adjacency, which is just a relationship between two neighbors. So basically, it's just a fancy way of saying, I'm running BGP, you're running BGP, we both have each other de uh, defined as neighbors, and we have made a connection between each other, and we're, we're, you know, and we're exchanging routing information. So an adjacency just means not only are you neighbors, uh, but you're friends, and, <laughs> and you're, you're talking to each other and you're exchanging information. So uh, you also have next hop, uh, which is another just a fancy way of saying where that tra where your traffic is going to be delivered. So it's basically a gateway for a route is your next hop. Um, and then metric or preference or weight, we're not going to get too much into that. I'll, I'll talk about it with OSPF a little bit, but it's usually just a way to express a preference for a path uh, when you have multiple choices. So you've got two WANs or two VPNs, you're, you're using the same router, routing protocol on both, and you want to give the protocol a way to pick one path over another. Um, now with OSPF, you might set a metric or a weight uh, or a metric on there. With BGP, I think it use weights, so you can actually do some tricks with inserting num uh, inserting uh, AS numbers into a path multiple times to make it longer, so it gets it doesn't get preferred as much. Things like that. So uh, just things to be on the lookout for. Uh, but we're probably not going to get too deep into into that kind of thing today. Okay, moving right along talk a little bit about BGP. Uh, BGP stands for Border Gateway Protocol. Uh, it routes between autonomous systems, you know, so everybody, each, each side of BGP is going to have its own AS number. Uh, each neighbor must have a BGP connection defined for every other neighbor to exchange routes. So you need to have a big full mesh defined. Everybody knows, has an explicit definition for every other BGP neighbor you're connected to. Um, so you know that can get that can have a bit of management overhead to it. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, now your neighbors each connect to each other using TCP port 179. Um, so it's a very simple service. It just runs on TCP. Uh, very easy to accommodate in firewall rules. Just you know allow TCP on that interface from your from your neighbor's address uh, on that interface to TCP port 179. Uh, uses path length and some other configured policies to make decisions. Uh, can do all kinds of fancy stuff like that. Um, we're not going to talk about how to make decisions with BGP today, but uh, there are tons of different uh, uh, ways you can control how it works. Uh, it's most BGP is most commonly used for exterior use cases, such as reaching the internet. Like you're talking, uh, your AS is talking to the internet, you know, or your ISP basically trying to reach the internet or the internet to reach you, that kind of thing. Uh, you can also use an AS... Uh, in, you can use BGP inside an AS for interior routing, uh, like IGP, IBGP, or between two local AS numbers for for IBGP. So for your example cases here, we're talking uh, an ISP may give you a full feed, which is the a routing table for the entire internet that they're sending down to you, uh, hundreds of thousands of routes. Um, and you know while you can do full feeds available for multiple ISPs. Uh, when you have those, you can make routing decisions pretty powerful about what traffic you send along each path um, based on, you know, what things are closer where, uh, who, which one is more efficient. You know, if one's got lost, you can kind of nudge things over to another. So you have very fine-grained control over your traffic and what gets sent where um, without, you know, based on 
uh, path lengths and things through each neighbor and without having to worry so much about uh, specifying networks manually because uh, it can kind of figure that kind of stuff out itself. Uh, but in order to do all that, it requires significant RAM and CPU. So uh, if you intend to run things with full feeds, you're not going to be doing that on a, on a, a weak little system with, with a little bit of RAM. You're going to have to have a pretty beefy box to handle that. Uh, you can also do a public IP allocation routing. So if you purchased an, uh, an IP allocation from an RIR, uh, you, they'll, you know, somebody will sign you an AS number and, you know, your, your network will be associated with that. And then, um, your, your routing will get figured out between the you and your ISP. Uh, that's another example of eBGP. And then again, I mentioned internal routing, IBGPs, you know, between two local things. So the example I'm going to actually show you configured today will be an IBGP example. Okay, so for OSPF, OSPF stands for Open Shortest Path First. Uh, it routes internally within an autonomous system or a single routing domain. So like things attached to a, uh, a multiple routers attached to a single shared layer two segment kind of idea, or, you know, two peers over a site to site link or VPN or, you know, directly connected in some way. Uh, so you're not going to be running this over an internet link. You're going to only going to be running it locally. Um, now the routers don't need to know about each other beforehand. So in the case of like BGP, where you had to manually define everything with OSPF, you don't, you just say, you know, talk OSPF on this interface, on this segment, and then anybody else in that segment can talk OSPF and you'll, you'll talk to them. Um, now there is some password protection you can put on that. So it's not entirely open to the world, but um, there's a lot less management overhead with that than it would, than you'll have with BGP. Although, you know, different roles, but uh, less, man less management overhead. OSPF runs over its own protocol, 89, so it's not a TCP or UDP port. It's actually its own separate protocol, just like TCP, UDP, there's OSPF. Uh, it uses multicast to distribute routes inside of broadcast domains, so it will it will just shoot this traffic out multicast on your, on your switches. And uh, so your connections between OSPF neighbors must be capable of using multicast. So um, if you've got like an L3 switch that does tricks with multicast, you may have to tweak that a bit. Um, if you have a site-to-site -site link, you know, it's going to have to carry multicast, multicast traffic. Um, or, you know, there, if you have a link that won't do multicast, like if you're talking about like an IPsec tunnel mode thing uh, between two sites, well, number one, you're not going to route over that with OSPF anyway. But uh, even, if you, even if you could, you know, that's not going to carry multicast in a traditional tunnel method. So... Um, OSPF uses area designations to provide to divide portions of networks. So uh, you'll have an area, and each router inside an area has a database of networks for that area. Um, so you won't have a, you won't see a single area on a large network because your database of, and everything will get huge and complicated with everybody having to know where everything else goes. Um, so there are ways that you can seg segment that into multiple areas, and then routes in and out of areas get summarized. Um, we're not going to talk about how, how that gets divvied up today, uh, but know that it's possible. And there's a lot of information out there about how you do that. Um, and you can set up different types of areas, uh, and those different types of areas accept different types of routes. Uh, we're not going to talk about that today, like stub areas and things like that. Uh, but uh, again, there's information out there about, how, about that if you want to look into segmenting your network in that way. So the kind of places you'll see OSPF going, uh, like edge router to an L3 switch or an internal router, um, over a VPN or dedicated site-to-site -site circuit, multiple where you've got multiple paths for VPN or other or other networks. One of the most common places we see people using uh, OSPF on PFSense is if you have two open VPN links or more uh, between two sites, and you run OSPF on each of those uh, on both sides, obviously. Um, and then you let OSPF decide which link to use to send traffic in which direction. So uh, OSPF will handle your routing back and forth. You can tweak your metrics so that it prefers one way and or the one way and or the other. It can't load balance in that way, but uh, it will uh, it'll let you at least uh, do failover decision, dis decisions in a very fast way. It only takes a few seconds to notice that uh, a link isn't working right. So uh, when would you want to use BGP or OSPF? Well, there is some overlap, so uh, <clears throat> you may have to make a choice in some cases, but we'll talk a little bit about their differences here. 
So B2P can work internally and externally. Uh, it's better the border handling border related tasks, uh, whereas OSPF is only for internal use. Uh, and the two can work together. You can have BGP at the edge uh, or set up to let routers find a path, like a default route or whatever. Uh, or you can do OSPF internally so routers know how to reach each other and other local networks. And you can do an OSPF. You can have OSPF distribute a default route, but uh, nothing quite as fancy as BGP as far as edge-related tasks. Uh, both can work with IPv4 and IPv6, depending on the implementations. Uh, OSPF has OSPF v2 for IPv4, and then a separate OSPF v3 or OSPF6 protocol for IPv6. Uh, whereas FRR uh, for BGP just uses BGP version 4, and that can handle IPv4 or IPv6 all in, all in one go. Uh, BGP has strictly defined peers, so it's got better security. Autonomous systems uh, keep things pretty well defined. Um, so it's not it's it's more strictly defined uh, and and more specific. Uh, BGP requires a full mesh where every peer defines every other peer, um, so that scales poorly on large internal networks because uh, you don't want to like I said if you've got a dozen or half a dozen routers and you want to do a full mesh you know that's going to be quite a, quite a lot of internal connections between them. Uh, so you, know, you don't want to have to think about that because you know every every router is going to connect to five other routers. And you know that adds up quick. And you know you add another router, and then every everyone's got every you have to go around and connect everything up again, and it's just uh, it, it does not scale well. Uh, you can do things like route ref route reflectors and confederation. Uh, we're not again we're not going to talk about that today, but there are ways you can simplify that. But again, it's not an, it's not ideal for internal routing. Uh, it can it can be done, but uh, it may not be the best choice. Uh, OSPF is much more dynamic. Uh, there's less overhead, less administrative overhead for each node, especially if, you know when you're all shared on a local seg segment. Um, OSPF tends to converge faster in most common cases. Um, although usually with BGP, you're talking like a full feed is going to be a massive table, and OSPF would be a lot smaller table. So of course the smaller table is going to going to converge faster than the than the uh, than the large table. Um, so you know if you're talking about a small, a couple of sites, you know you that maybe you. Uh, neck and neck in terms of convergence time, uh, although OSPF does tend to still still make an adjacency faster and notice things faster, but it's not always, uh, you know, you can tweak timers and things to, to make it a lot closer. Uh, BGP uses TCP. OSPF requires multicast in its own protocol, so that may factor into your decision making as well for how your links between your, uh, your nodes uh, can carry traffic. Uh, BGP can use TCP MD5 signatures for authentication and security at the packet level. Um, it, that that particular feature doesn't work over OpenVPN, but it'll work over like regular interfaces of VLANs and things like that. Um, OSPF can have password authentication, but it's a different mechanism to it. It's not the, the same kind of packet level stuff as uh, as the TCP MD5 signatures. Uh, FRR is capable of redistributing BGP routes to OSPF and vice versa. Um, so you can have some part of your routes coming in via BGP, and then that same router could also connect into your OSPF infrastructure, um, and you could distribute some things you know, back and forth either way. Um, you can use route maps to filter what things go where. Um, at least you can use route maps on the BGP side. In our, in our package GUI, we don't have... Uh, the route map stuff exposed for OSPF, but uh, there is a do not redistribute list you can build in OSPF that will that lets you have a similar kind of feature there. Um, so OSPF routers, again, they know the entire topology to every segment within the area, which can get complicated pretty fast, whereas BGP only knows the next hop to your des next destination, depending on your setup. Okay, so I've uh, mentioned FRR a bit. So what is FRR? Uh, FRR is also known as FR routing uh, or as the free range routing project. It is a fork of Quagga. So it works at the moment. It's very close to Quagga. It works a lot like Quagga, uh, except it was forked from Quagga because a lot of large contributors uh, were looking to increase the pace of development. Uh, one in particular, I think they had a, pa a backlog of a, f a few thousand patches that were not getting merged into Quagga that they wanted to get merged in. Uh, and there were, you know, just a few other large contributors sort of in the same boat. Everybody's waiting on all these things to happen, but Quagga was just, you know, going along at its, at its own pace. 
uh, you know, trying to trying to take all this stuff in. So uh, the Fort Quagga and the FRR got all the stuff into it, and they're they're moving right along. And they've even got I think there's even there's even a new major version ahead of what we've got in PF Sense out. Um, so it's uh, it's moving along pretty quick, uh, and it's actually at least for our customers that we've noticed it's been a lot more stable than uh, than Quagga has been. Uh, FRR handles dynamic routing, does, so it does BGP, OSPF, OSPF v, uh, v3, ISIS, or is is however you want to pronounce that, uh, LDP, PIM, and RIP. Uh, now, our GUI only has support for BGP, OSPF, and OSPF6. Uh, we could add those other proto add other protocols in later, but at the moment we're only going to use uh, BGP and OSPF. So FRR is very similar to Quagga. Uh, it's got dedicated daemons for every protocol. Then it has the zebra daemon to coordinate everything. So um, all these, uh, your individual routing protocol daemons will talk to zebra. Zebra talks to the operating system and maintains route the, the central routing databases and things like that. So if you hear me talk about zebra, um, then it's just like the coordinator or the global or the main routing daemon uh, portion of FRR and Quagga for that matter. Um, so our, our, the FRR package on PFSense, uh, right now, it's available on 2.4.2 and 2.3.5. Um, if you're not on the most recent version of 2.4x or 2.3x, you want to make sure you get up to that. I mean, the package is there for some of the older versions, but we don't keep the older versions up to date. You want to make sure you get up to the most recent point release or a snapshot. Obviously, if you're running development, those, get, those also get the most recent code. Uh, the FRR package was designed as a replacement for both Quagga and OpenBGPD, which both had some problems. Uh, the, the Quagga package it only had GUI controls for OSPF. Um, you could do a manual configuration for BGP in a raw, in a raw config, but it wasn't ideal. Uh, OpenBGPD had several behavioral, pro behavioral problems, which limited how it was used. Uh, we, had, we got a lot of complaints from customers about it, it, it not performing the way they wanted or in, you know, to, the, to their satisfaction in one way or another. Um, both open both Quagga and OpenBGPD both they had BGPD binaries uh, of the exact same name, so the packages conflicted. So you couldn't have both at the same time. Um, so you couldn't have a GUI for both BGP and OSPF at the same time. Uh, OpenBGPD had problems with IPsec. If they were run together, um, you get PF key errors, and your IPsec traffic would just seize up. Um, and that problem does not occur with FRR. So if you're seeing, if you had like an AWS VPC VPN set up with OpenBGPD and you were getting those PF key errors, your traffic was dying, you know, just rip out OpenBGPD, put in FRR, configure it up, and it'll work it without, it'll, it won't, you won't have those interruptions anymore. Uh, another thing I didn't note on here, but we also had some complaints about Quagga um, handling the routes at the operating system level, especially if it was exited and, and restarted. Uh, in a bad way that it just wasn't handling those very well, and the the same issues did not occur with FRR. So uh, we're 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 all around. People have been happier with the behavior of FRR, um, and in general, uh, it's been a it's been a pretty strong performer. So we brought all these features together, BGP and OSPF, um, into one package, uh, and we greatly expanded the availability of GUI options. Uh, and so you can use BGP and OSPF together now without any manual workarounds. Uh, and that the GUI for OSPF and BGP has been beefed up quite a bit. Uh, in particular, BGP, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of options uh, that, that weren't even in OpenBGPD. Uh, so there's just a ton of things you can do that, that may not have uh, been possible before. Um, Another thing we did is uh, there were some things that were good about the Quagga status and some things that were good about the OpenBGP data, Open BGPD status. So we com we took the best of both worlds there and combined the status code together. Um, so under status and FRR, there's a menu entry now. Uh, and also um, in there, you'll have filtering and data limiting. Um, so you can deal with better with large routing tables. Like if you've got a full feed from your ISP, you're not going to want to try to look at that routing table without, you know, paginating or looking at only a certain subset or filtering it in some way. Uh, there are multiple status views. Uh, so we've got one tab per protocol, plus we have a general tab with uh, Zebra and summary info. Uh, so, and, and we've coded it in such a way where, you know, it wouldn't be too hard to drop support in for another protocol. Like we could add in the support for something like uh, ISIS or PIM without a ton of trouble. Uh, we would just have to go through uh, like we did for BGP, and, and look at all of the different options that are there in FRR and try and build up a GUI around it. 
Uh, and a, a question we get sometimes too is why do we go with why do we decide to move forward with FRR and not something else like Bird? Well, we were familiar with Quagga, and FRR looked like the natural progression from Quagga to something a little bit more modern. Um, FRR has been very stable in FreeBSD, the same as Quagga, and it's just a, a personal preference. You know, a lot of our guys that we do routing internally and things like that. You know, a couple of them liked Bird, more often like Quagga and FRR. Uh, especially in terms of being familiar with the underlying syntax and debugging and troubleshooting, that kind of stuff. All right, so how do we get to the package? Well, just like any other package, uh, it's just under your package manager. So system package manager, you go to the available packages tab, and it's just there under FRR. And the current version will be 0 0.1. Actually, it uh, should be 0 0.1.1 um, at the moment. I'm running a snapshot here, so it doesn't always, it won't get a new version until the uh, until the next snapshot run. Um, but you'll see 0 0.1 or 0 0.1.1, and, and uh, you can install it from there. Or it might be a later version by the time you get around to trying it. Um, once the package is installed, you know, you, you know, you'll install it like any other package. Uh, you'll just, you know, hit the plus button and, uh, to add it from the list and then confirm or to install and then confirm. Once it's installed, you'll see the services menu entries. There's uh, FRR BGP, FRR Global Zebra, OSPF, OSPF6, and also status FRR. Now, there are far too many tabs for us to make tabs for everything here. You'd have multiple rows, and it would be ugly and hard to figure out what you're doing. So we we took a little liberty and made a, a little convention here where I'm in the global settings. So these tabs here are for other areas of the global settings. Um, and if you move to a different area, like you'll have brackets around it. So to get from the global settings to BGP, rather than going up, to, you could go to services in BGP, or you can just go here to BGP. And you'll see the tab set changed, and now we're just looking at BGP settings. And now we've got a link back to our global settings section, or OSPF or OSPF6. So if I want to look at OSPF, I just come over here to the OSPF tab, and now I've got the OSPF settings. And then you can just kind of navigate around like that. And you can always hit the status from over here. Uh, if you're in global settings, you hit status. It takes you to the main status page. If you're under BGP and you click status, it's going to take you to the to the detailed status for BGP. So it's kind of it's kind of intelligent about where it takes you when. Um, but just remember that you know this is inside your section, and these are for other sections. Uh, one thing to remember, and I'll reiterate it again in a couple more slides here, before you do anything else, you have to do enable FRR here and configure the global settings tab. Um, if you want to use BGP, for example, you have to enable BGP as well as enabling FRR, because if you don't, uh, it won't run, <laughs> uh, because this is the global on off or master switch for everything. So you could leave that unchecked, completely configure everything, and then at the end, throw that switch and turn on FRR. Um, so let's look, take a quick look at our status section here. Like this, this router here only has BGP configured on it. So on all, we've got a little bit, a little summary from Zebra and a couple of options from BGP. Uh, there are tabs under here for specific details about things like the detail from Zebra. You'll get, see not just the routes, but CPU interfaces and memory. Uh, over here for BGP, you'll get routes uh, for V4 and V6, and then a lot more information about groups and next hops and memory and stuff like that. And OSPF's not enabled, so that this router won't show me anything for that. But uh, you can get, get around that way. So uh, because the, the GUI is large, there's tons of tabs and lots of settings on every tab, but just don't be too intimidated by it. I know we've had a lot of people say, oh, wow, it looks so complicated, but it's really not. There's a lot of things there. It's just, mean, it's just powerful. Um, if you don't recognize an option, odds are you probably don't need it. Um, it's so, I mean, there's a lot of power in it, but uh, we couldn't very well hide everything behind advanced buttons because the GUI would be very small with tons of advanced buttons you, and people would have a hard time finding things. Um, but for most cases, you're just going to use a few options on, on some of the screens and you'll be done. Uh, if you need more than that, it's there. 
uh, but if you don't recognize something, if you use if it's a term or concept you're not familiar with, uh, you can look through the FRR user guide, and I've got a link there. Uh, now it's not a perfect guide. You know, so there are you know some things that it's lacking a, a bit of detail, uh, but we tried to use all of their terminology. Um, so if you see a term in our GUI and you search on it, you might add in like a FRR BGP blah, or even Quagga BGP blah, or just BGP blah, and you'll you'll find you'll find information about that term. Um, so that we use pretty standard, pretty standard terminology. Uh, we tried to follow FRR, and FRR itself followed a lot of things from Quagga. So, uh, if you're looking for information, you know, check for something specific to PFSense. You don't see it. Check for something specific to FRR. You don't see it. <laughs> check for something specific to Quagga. Uh, you can kind of work your way down, and then if you don't see anything like that, you know, just check for something with the generic routing protocol information. You'll probably find something eventually. Uh, so, we tried to we tried to be very good with what we have, but you know, there's always going to be other sources of information out there if, if uh, you can't find anything. Uh, another thing too, uh, to note, because we've got dynamic routing protocols, you'll probably see something you've not seen before. If you go to your diagnostics and diagnostics routes, um, in the flags category here, the routes that you get from routing protocols will have a one on them. So anything you see that ends in a one is going to have, uh, is it, that came from a routing protocol. Um, so on this one, it's just getting a few routes from BGP. So it's UG1, 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 like that. So um, be on the lookout for those one routes. All right, so now we get into configuring these things. First, just on this first tab here, so no matter what protocol you use, you, you have to enable the main settings first. So you can go to services and FRR Global Zebra, or if you're already in one other section of FRR, you can skip over here using the, the global or global settings tab. Uh, you want to check enable FRR, you put in a master password. This master password is only used internally to talk between Zebra and the other management daemons. Um, so it's it's used, mostly it's used by the status tab to gather information uh, from the various daemons because it has to have a way to communicate with them. It's not a password that's exposed to the world or anything or that external services will use to connect back to you. Uh, you can configure the locking if you want. Um, you can set a global router ID here. You can also set specific router IDs that override this in the BGP and OSPF sections. Uh, but it's easiest if you just define a router ID here and let the other ones pull from pull from it. Um, so again, just like I just dropped my LAN IP address in there and that's really it. Uh, you could, if you're using this in a CARP environment and you want to have two separate instances, you can set a CARP status IP here. Um, so if the if it's in a, if the VIP is in a backup status, then FRR won't run. When it turns to master, it'll run, uh, and and when it goes to backup, it'll stop. Uh, that's you know, it's whether or not you do it that way, it's up to you that you can, I'm not going to get too deep into that, but just to put a long story short, you could do a status that way and do it, or you could have multiple feeds coming in for BGP from like to both boxes and do it that way. So that that's a, a, a much more advanced situation than we're going to talk about today, but it's, there are several different ways to tackle that. Uh, route handling here, uh, just in the last couple of days, I added a feature where you can set up static routes in here. And these routes are set in Zebra so they are global between all routing daemons. Uh, and you can use these to influence what routes get distributed through BGP and OSPF, um, because they can they can just say, instead of manually defining a list of networks in either one, you can tell them to just redistribute these static routes, and then uh, this, will, this could be your list of routes that you distribute. Now, these routes do go in your routing table, um, but you can, pick, you can just enter a subnet here, and then you pick where it goes. It could go through a BGP neighbor, it could go through a gateway you've got, or it could go to localhost if it's just a summary route for your local networks, or, or it could go out as, go out and just by an interface. Uh, one way you might use this is if you've got a bunch of VPNs, and they all have different tunnel networks, but they're all in a, a global range, but you don't actually have a route for something that covers them all. So say like all your VPNs were like um, 10, 14, 1, slash 10 slash 30, 10, 14, 4, slash 30, 10, 14, 8, slash 30, whatever, uh, a bunch of slash 30s. Um, so you could just, you could make a static route here that says, you know, 10, 14, 1, 0, slash 24, goes to localhost and then tell you to distribute statics. And then lo and, then everybody gets a summary route for all of your VPNs instead of having to do each and every one individually. 
Um, so just another way you can manipulate things uh, and, and do things in a little bit simpler way, just by taking a couple of extra steps. So that's the general info here. Um, now that we've talked about setting up in general, we're going to have to get into specifics for the routing protocol. So first, we're going to talk about BGP. Now, before you can set up BGP, you have to know a few things. You have to know what type of setup you're doing. So is it a site-to-site -site link? Is it an ISP uplink? Uh, we're going to be doing an, uh, just a quick site-to-site -site IBGP example, but it's not that different from others. Um, you know, you're going to always have to have your local AS number. Uh, if it's a local or private setup, like we're going to do a site-to-site -site link, you can use a private AS number. Uh, and those are in the range 64,512 up to 65,534. Um, even if you can use four-byte AS numbers, it's probably easier to stick to these in, this, in, that, in that reserved range if you can. Uh, or you can use the much higher range. Uh, there's, what, several million <laughs> uh, in, the, in the upper area of that reserved range for four-byte AS numbers. Uh, if you've got a public allocation, your AS number will be assigned to you, so you need to ask your IR or your ISP. Uh, that number will be assigned to you, so you'll have to you'll have to determine that some other way. So that's your local info. You have to know your remote info as well. So you need to know the remote neighbor address and AS number for your peer, your neighbor. Um, if that's you, then you'll know your address because it'll be something you're connected to. You'll be able to know what that is. And uh, you can just make up your own local private AS number. If it's your ISP, you'll have to know what address they're going to use for BGP, and they will have to tell you what their AS number is. So that'll come. That info will come from your peer. Uh, you have to decide what networks are going to be advertised through BGP. If it's private, it's up to you. You could set that list of networks in BGP. You could redistribute things from other from other areas. Uh, and I'll go over those settings in a minute. Uh, if it's public, then it will be the address block that you've that you've uh, been allocated. Um, so you, you'll have to know how that works there. Uh, so if it's for a vendor link, you'd have to agree on what that is on both sides. Um, and again, just double check your firewall rules. If this is going to be on your WAN, you have to allow TCP 179 traffic from your neighbor's remote address into you. Um, so if it's your uh, uh, ISP, you know, it'll be on your WAN. If it's a link on a site-to-site -site link or a VPN, then that interface you'll have to allow that traffic in. In addition to the traffic that you're going to allow in uh, for the routed networks, that is. So talking more specifically about configuring BGP, so we've got our global settings. You have to do those first. So make sure you've got FRR enabled first. And then pop over here to BGP. Either You can either go through the, st the services, FRR BGP, or you can just click the BGP section and just come to the BGP tab here. Uh, you'll enable BGP, set it to log adjacency changes if you want, drop in your local AS number. Uh, you can leave your router ID blank as long as you specified it in the global settings. It has to be one place or the other. Uh, you can set up timers if you want. Most of the time you're going to leave those blank. You don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, you can set, you know, a specific uh, keep alive or hold time if you want. Uh, generally, those are things you agree upon with your peer. You can set any redistribute values here that you want. Now, these are this, these would be shorthands for just distributing sets of routes that you don't define manually. I have manually defined my LAN in IPv4 and IPv6, and I've got those both here. Um, but you could also choose to re redistribute connected networks, which are networks that you have local direct connections to on every interface. Uh, you could choose to redistribute uh, static routes, which are the, the FRR static routes, which are defined on the global settings tab that, that I showed you a little bit ago. You could just redistribute the kernel routing table, which are your static routes from like uh, system routing on the static routes tab, in addition to any other automatic routes you've done. Uh, or you could also choose to redistribute OSPF routes to BGP neighbors. So uh, if you have OSP, an OSPF connection to uh, peers locally, and then you want to redistribute that to a BGP peer over another site-to-site -site link, you can do that. Um, and it, you know your your BGP peers will send that traffic to you, and then you can send it to your OSPF neighbors, and and it can flow straight through like that. So at, once you've got all those that defined, you can define your networks here. Once you're all done with that, do save, and then come over there and do the neighbors. Um, so 
on the, we, we won't need to do anything on the advanced tab. We'll just go over here to neighbors. Let's see here. Under neighbors, you'll need an entry on here for every, other, every neighbor you've got. And so again, full mesh, you'll have to get that through. And I, I've got a bunch of neighbors defined here. We're only gonna be config, con, concerned with a couple of those. I'm gonna focus on this one right here first. Actually these two, because I just, for an example, I set up IPv4 and IPv6 just to show you what they look like. So first we've got our name and address of the peer, name or address of the peer. So I've got the IP address of my peer in there. I gave it a description and you wanna put a description in there because this will show through in the uh, the status from FRR, it will have the description here, so it makes it a lot easier to track down information. Um, we're not going to go over peer groups today, but if you have several connections to the same you know, remote, or several connections that behave the same, the same remote AS, whatever, you can do, do a peer group. Uh, you can do a password here if you want. If you do put in a password, um, there are a bunch of different options here, but the one we found that actually works the best is put FRR and set key bidirectional. Uh, that will set the password to be, uh, it'll do the TCP MD5 verification, and it will do that for outbound and inbound traffic. Uh, and that works the best, especially against uh, like Cisco or other, other equipment. Uh, your basic options here, the only thing you really need to worry about is the remote AS. Uh, you can set any of this other stuff you want, like an update source. If you've got, say, uh, multiple... IP alias VIPs or a CARP VIP or something that you want to send your updates from, you can set a specific address here if you want, but it's not necessary. Uh, let's see, you can, yeah, any of this other stuff is a lot more advanced. We don't, you're not going to have to worry about pretty much any of this in most cases. It's there if you need it, uh, but it, in most cases you're not going to need it. So just do all that, hit save. And just to make sure everything is synchronized all the way around, you can go back to the BGP tab and hit save, but uh, it should do the right thing if you save on a neighbor. And then you can hop on over to the status here and it'll, we'll look and see what we've got. Uh, you can see here, uh, these are routes that I've received from BGP coming from some of my neighbors. And these are IPv6 routes I've got from my neighbors. Um, this is just a quick little summary table that shows you your neighbor, your neighbors and some the AS number and some traffic. So it's just a, a brief uh, overview. And then here's a detailed list of all your neighbor information. Uh, I'm going to skip down to here's the neighbor we, we were just looking at. It, it shows my the, the neighbor. It's got the remote address here. It's got the remote AS number and this is our local AS number they're connected to. It has my description that I entered in the GUI. It knows the remote host name because BGP will exchange that information. It shows the router ID for the remote host. Uh, the state is established, and that's what you want to see. Uh, if it shows active, that means it's not even trying to go, which is not really a good one to, one to see. Uh, if it shows connecting, it's trying to connect, but it you know, hasn't quite got there yet, so maybe your traffic is blocked or you know the other side isn't configured or up, you know something like that. Uh, it has a lot of other status information here about traffic it's sent and received. Um, and it, it knows your local and remote host and next hop, and it, it'll even figure out if you if both nodes have IPv6 and you're trying to send IPv6 routes, you can, it, you can exchange BGP over IPv4 and it will actually still be able to route to the neighbor IP, neighbor's IPv6 info because it, it, it will glean that from this. Um, so I've set up an IPv6 and an IPv4 peering. I, you shouldn't have to set up both. Uh, it just, it'll use that as an alternate path if you want uh, for BGP, but, uh, It'll still try to. It still needs to have both v4 and v6 knowledge because you can't route v4 to v6 and vice versa. But it tries to figure all that out, even if BGP itself is only running over one. So it's not like a tunnel. It's just exchanging the routing information about your nodes, and then it kind of figures out what it needs from there. Okay, so I've got a bunch of other neighbors on here. You can look at your next hops, and it shows you which you know some information about where what it is and where they're going, member usage, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we can come over here to the Zebra tab or the All tab. And on, this, on the All tab and the Zebra tab, you want to look at the Zebra routes because you want to see the 
the B means it comes from BGP, then the angle bracket and the star means it's selected and it's in your FIB, your forwarding information base. So uh, that's uh, what you want to see. Uh, this one you can see these routes came from BGP, these routes came from BGP. Now if you're curious about um, when I talked about redistribution of your connected or kernel networks, like your, your kernel network routes, anything with, marked with a K would be marked as a kernel route you would be distributing if you chose that option. And anything with a C is a connected network that you would be distributing if you chose that option. So let's pop over here and look at the peer. This is the same kind of deal here. Uh, let's see in BGP, it's just the opposite way. It's connecting back to the opposite way. And then we just go over here to status. You can see it actually received all of those routes that the other one knew from BGP, uh, except you know it, it also has a route to that other host. And see, it's got all, it, it knows how to directly connect to all those other places because I've just got them talking all on a shared WAN. So it's kind of a weird situation you may not actually see in real life, but uh, it was just uh, easier to do it that way in my lab than it was to set up some kind of dedicated site to site to site to site to site link linkage there. Um, so if you see all that, you see all you got, you got all your routes, then you're really done. That's uh, so that's it. So for OSPF, let's uh, move on and do OSPF a little bit. So uh, preparing for OSPF, you just need to uh, determine how your interfaces are going to be involved or which interfaces and how they'll be involved in OSPF. Uh, you'll have two types of interfaces, active and passive. Active interfaces are interfaces that actually will advertise OSPF. So say you've got your LAN that's local and you've got VPN links that you want to advertise OSPF on. The only things you're going to talk to OSPF are your VPN. So you'd add your VPN interfaces, mark them, or they would be active. Your LAN, there's no OSPF routers there. It would be passive. Uh, and then their passive network interfaces will have their networks distributed out. So basically, if you want to, you have a VPN link to appear, it's talking OSPF, and you want it to reach your LAN, then your LAN would be passive because that's the network you want to list in OSPF and your VPNs would be active, so that's where it talks OSPF to your peers. So just think about it that way. Uh, so if you've got multiple links to the same remote, you'll also need to know which of those paths is preferred. If you've got two VPNs running on two WANs, uh, WAN 1 and WAN 2, you know, you'll know you have to know which one of those you want it to prefer for failover, because it has to. you'll have to come up, come up with metrics to define um, so if you're WAN 1, that's the one you want to use, that'd be a metric 10. WAN 2, you don't want to use that unless WAN 1 is down, you put that as a metric of 20, for example. Um, so your OS, you have to know your OSPF area. Um, if you don't know that or you don't care, everything's in one area, you just use all zeros. Zero, 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 zero. That's what we're going to do in this example. That's what most people will do. Uh, once you grow above a certain size, you'll have to work into multiple areas, but for most people, they won't have to care about that. Um, at least most people are using it the way we see them use it in PFSense, I'll put it that way. Uh, you can certainly do remote multiple areas, but you make sure you'll have to research more about OSPF and figure that out if you want to even get into that uh, to, to know. But if you have a lot of networks and they're easily summarizable, uh, then you might look into multiple areas to keep your uh, database small. Um, you'll have to add firewall rules on your active interfaces that will allow OSPF protocol. Uh, and you can't be too strict about that because it, it does need to uh, come in from multicast. So you have to make sure you're uh, allowing from your, your peers and from the multicast destinations. And uh, so your rules for that, you may as well just allow all OSPF on that particular interface. Um, but you know, it, OSPF traffic is not going to ever leave your local layer two segment. So it's not like it's going to come at you from the internet or anything. So you don't have to worry about that too much. I mean, you could, you know, set your destination specific to be the multicast destinations it uses. I don't have those off the top of my head, but uh, they're easily locatable. Uh, so, and again, I, I mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again, your active interfaces have to support multicast. Um, so again, not going to be seeing that with IPsec at least with the, the current tunnel interfaces we have. Um, OpenVPN, you're going to have to use static key site to sites. Um, or if you do SSL TLS, it would have to have a slash 30 tunnel network, uh, which triggers it to work in the point to point, site to site way. 
uh, or point to point static style way. Um, you could use, I think you use tap with a subnet because that'll pass multicast. Um, but like ton mode, I think even in topology subnet, I don't think that gets you the what you get gets you what you need for OSPF. I think last time I tried that, that did not work right. Um, that has been a little while, so maybe my information's outdated on that, but um, you're best off to stick with a static key or tap with a subnet. So talking about OSPF, let me hop over to this host over here where we're going to be talking OSPF. Uh, first, you got to do global settings. Always do those first. Enable FRR, master password, router ID. This one down here, I just had a couple examples here. Like it's not going to accept a route for this. It's going to add a null route for that. And I've got, like I mentioned before, my my VPN networks all are under this subnet. And so I've set that up as a local host route. And this is just going to add a static route here. And we'll see how that works out in a minute. Um, so I save those, come over here to OSPF. And you can get there from services, FRR, OSPF. Or if you're already in FRR, just go to the OSPF uh, section. Uh, we Now, first, you have to skip over the settings tab and go straight for interfaces because the interfaces have to be defined first. Um, so always do the interfaces first. Um, you'll need an entry on this interfaces tab for every interface involved with OSPF. So uh, first up, I did my LAN. And I just, this is my LAN. I just put LAN interface. Um, I don't need a metric on this, it's just local. It's a, pa interface is passive, it's a passive interface. Um, so what that means, like I mentioned before, if it's passive, you're not gonna be transmitting OSPF out on this interface. It's just going to announce this network for use by OSPF. And below that is accept filter. Um, so when you have that checked, it will stop a peer or a neighbor from sending you a route to this network. So basically you're saying, you can't send me a route for this. I have I know this, it's my route locally. <laughs> uh, because you don't want to end up sending traffic for your own network out through some peer and then back to you and you'd end up with a routing loop. At A routing loop at best and at worst, you might, you know, some other th protocols might fail. So you want that, uh, you, you don't want to be accept, accept routes for your own networks. Um, you can leave most of the other stuff blank, especially for a passive interface. You don't have to worry about it too much. Save that. And then this, this particular example, I've got two VPN links. I've got two different open VPN servers here and the other side has clients. Um, so I define, I set up OSPF on both of them. Interface here, I've got my WAN1. Mark that as WAN1. I put a metric as 10 because this is the one I'm going to prefer. It's not, it's an active interface. So this passive is unchecked. Accept filter is checked because I don't want to get back a route for my own network again. Save that. Come over here to WAN2. Exactly the same, except it's the, the other WAN, WAN2, metric of 20. That way it's a higher cost. Accept filter, save. Now, once you have all of your interfaces defined, like see, I've got all three of my interfaces here. That's all that's going to be involved come over here to the OSPF settings, enable OSPF routing, uh, I've, logged my, I've set it to log the adjacency, lift the router ID blank, so I've got that over on the global settings tab, so I don't need it. Uh, you can do your area here, if you need it, uh, set your logging, let's see. Uh, you can do any of the redistribute options, they work very similar to the ones I mentioned for BGP. Connect it, you can redistribute your connected networks. Uh, your kernel routing table, uh, you can redistribute BGP to OSPF. Uh, you can redistribute a default route out to your P your neighbors. Say, you know, hey, okay, you reach the internet through me. Uh, and you can redistribute FRR static routes if you want, which are the routes, again, back on the global settings tab. And we'll see how that works here in a moment. And that's it. You can, you can set this other stuff if you want. Uh, mostly just hit save and you're done. Come over here to status. Now, general is just some local information about OSPF and how it's running here and the, the areas it knows about, that kind of stuff. And then you'll want to look at your neighbors here. 
Uh, if you don't see anything, then you're not getting OSPF. You're not, you know, you know there's nothing else, nothing else coming else, nothing coming in from peers to you or neighbors to you. Um, but here I, sh I show two entries. So I've got two neighbors. You can see here it's on 102.2 and 103.2, and it shows they're actually on Open v OVPNS3 and OVPNS4. It's got a full uh, DR other status here. Uh, and they have the same neighbor ID. So see, it's smart enough to know it's the same neighbor, but I've got two paths to that neighbor. And then it shows my network here. And this uh, this site that we're looking at here is the 10.4 network, and the, the other P, the neighbor is 10.5. And we're getting a few routes in here, uh, the OSPF database. You can keep on going down there. But I want to go back over here to uh, Zebra because I want to look at the Zebra routes. And we're looking for stuff with the O here because we're working with OSPF, so we're looking for the O. So uh, this is my network directly connected to VMX1 here, and it's O, so it's, it's entering that route into OSPF. Um, this S, see, that's the static route I set up, and it is uh, directly connected to my local host, and that's going to be redistributed because uh, I told it to redistribute static routes. Uh, here's another O. This is the other, the 10.5 network it received from the other peer. Another O here. And it notice it did not select that because that's uh, on. It's the one it uh, filtered out. 10.5 uh, here is a slash 24. These are connected networks on the other side. Those are all coming via OSPF. And here's a black hole to that that null route I had set up just as an example as well. So um, come over here. Here's its neighbor. This guy's actually running Quagga, and FRR will work just fine. You can pair you can pair FRR to Quagga. You can pair FRR to OpenBGPD. You can pair it up to Cisco's whatever. It's very easily compatible with other stuff. No worries there. Um, now if I come down here, you'll see it's the other side of this. It's got 10.4. Uh, knows all that. Now let's look at our zebra routes on this side, and we got a route to the our the other host for 10.4. We got our static route to our summarized VPN networks. Uh, we've got a few o, other O's that have come in that are good. So everything looks good between those. So really, that's it. Um, so if you want to convert from OpenBGP to FRR, and I'll show you this 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 person over here, this firewall over here is actually running OpenBGP, and it was connected back to here. Um, Really, there's nothing different on your FRR side uh, if you're peering up to it. Uh, but if you want to convert from OpenBGPD, there's just a couple of little quirks to look out for. Um, the FRR configuration is simpler in some ways. Uh, OpenBGPD required you to make a group, and you don't have to do that in FRR. You can put the remote AS directly on a neighbor. You don't have to make a peer group. Um, so just note down what your AS is. If you only have one neighbor, it, per group, um, it's super easy. You just do away with the groups. You don't need them at all. You just have to know which remote AS goes to which neighbor. When you're looking at your neighbor options in OpenBGPD, um, you know obviously you just got your your neighbor here. You can your remote address, your remote AS would come from the, the groups. This is your your neighbor name address. Uh, if you use the TCP MD5 options, those are on the password. Remember to set that to FRR and set key by directional. Um, if you were using an address like this local address X here, uh, that would be update source on the FRR side. And I think pretty much all of these other possible uh, options here are either in the neighbor options in FRR or uh, maybe in the advanced tab uh, if they were global. But you know anything you can anything you can possibly do here is going to be on the neighbor tab in FRR. Uh, but the, those two are the, mo are the most common ones we've seen people ask about. Just local address X here because it's called update source in FRR. And uh, you know you, you can do away with the groups entirely if you've just got one, one peer per group or one neighbor per group. Uh, if you had a raw configuration, um, the syntax with FRR is going to be a bit different. So you're going to have to find out how to translate that on your own. We don't have a guide for that. Uh, but we never really did support raw configuration. So if you knew enough to make that on your own, it should be fairly simple for you to pick up the, the syntax from FRR uh, and, and see that. And you may even not even need a raw configuration uh, in FRR if you can do everything you need to do in the GUI. 
Quagga to Qua or from Quagga to FRR, um, it's a bit easier because FRR is a fork of Quagga. The configuration is almost identical. Uh, the GUI does have some slight differences uh, because, like, if we look here, Quagga only had this one settings tab. Now, some of these actually go to Zebra and some of them go to OSPF. So some of these settings were split off to be in the global settings and some of them are in the OSPF settings. Uh, but really all the same all the same options are here. They just might be worded slightly differently or they might uh, uh, just be in a slightly different location. So some of these things are like the disable read or Disable redistribution, or no, it was disable acceptance. Like if you look here, this list at the bottom here just is disable redistribution because that's all that just sets that up as a internally as a route map in F, in, uh, in OSPF. The disable acceptance is actually under global settings now. Do not accept. Um, but if you're looking for some of the other things, like the interface configuration, I think that's 99, if not 100% identical. So you don't have to even worry about that. You just go page for page, take screenshots, take notes, you know, look at your config, whatever. It can't pull in the settings automatically. Um, but, you know, there's not that big of a difference. Uh, if you did a manual raw configuration, that should just copy and paste and carry over. There might be a, some slight adjustments, but not much. So uh, really, that's, I mean, there's not that much to it. Um, just as a little bonus, I thought I'd mention, if you are going to do the AWS VPC VPN, if you've already done it and you want to move from OpenBGP to FRR, uh, or if you're just getting started with it, um, the exact details are going to vary depending on your setup, but they're not that different from standard. So uh, obviously, you enable FRR globally and put in a router ID, which I think it was supposed to be your virtual IP address for your local end of the tunnel. Um, so like if you, you set your router ID to um, like the local the local uh, IP alias VIP that it sets up or that you want to set up, uh, enable BGP, put in the local AS that, that you were assigned for the VPC, uh, the hold time, uh, I think you just leave that at the default if the, or if there's one set in the VPC, you can just copy that. Um, your networks are going to be the networks for your side of the VPN to VPC. So basically just whatever networks you have defined in your IPsec P2. Uh, make sure you don't select a route map or anything there. Uh, your BGP neighboring uh, your for your neighbor is the remote address is the VPC remote address, like the 169254 address. Uh, the remote AS is whatever they tell you the AS number is for the remote side of the VPC VPN uh, in, your, in the configuration they give you. And the update source is going to be your local virtual IP address. Um, so that'd be like your your side's 169254 address. Uh, if you're using NetGate device, you got the factory image. There's a VPC wizard. Uh, we are working on getting that converted to FRR. Uh, but if you want to, you can run through the wizard uh, and then just remove OpenBGPD and install FRR, dump in this configuration. Uh, before you do configure anything in FRR, um, there is a slight bug in the wizard. You want to go into um, your VIPs under firewall virtual IPs edit the VIP that it makes and save it, uh, and then configure FRR, uh, just to work around a little quirk there. And that's, again, that's something we're working on getting fixed in the wizard. Uh, we're just, we've got some stuff, uh, it's just a little bit backlog getting that in the wizard, but um, that'll be up before too long. Uh, so that, all right, that's it. Uh, I don't know if anybody had any other questions. I got a little bit of time for, for questions if you need to, if you had any, if there's something I didn't cover. I don't really want to get into anything too advanced, but if there's anything kind of uh, basic I didn't get to. I can show something or whatever, actually. I guess if you have a question, you can type it out. There was one more thing I wanted to show you. I can... What I wanted to do was to show you that this particular guy here, or this firewall, has in Zebra, you'll see, It's connected in some ways. It's got some OSPF routes, and it's also got BGP routes. So we've got some things coming from BGP and some things coming from OSPF. Um, so because this one is sort of a central node, I just want to show you what it looks like. Uh, over here, we look in our Zebra routes. You see, we've, we've only got um, 
just for an example, this other node is connected to this one. Donna's connected to Martha with OSPF. So that was 10, five going to four. And then this one over here, see we know about four but via BGP, but we don't know about five. And it's getting that actually through, through here. So there's just a whole big long chain of things happening here. But if I redistribute OSPF routes to BGP neighbors, and then I come over here to OSPF, and I want to redistribute BGP to OSPF neighbors. Now, it might take it a moment or two for this to filter all the way through, but I don't know. I can't remember how fast it actually happens. Don't. Because the, the, everything has to reconverge here. There we go. See, now we got a route to 10.5 from BGP. And that actually came from BGP to, from over here, which talked to BGP to here, which would talk to OSPF to here. And if we come over here, we should, if we check our status, have a route to um, to 10.8 or 10.80. There, and we got that from OSPF. So it sends that over here to the VPN, then this sends it over here. Uh, and it knows how to get there. So uh, you can make a, a pretty fully dynamic setup here that, where you know everybody reaches, everybody knows how to get to everybody just through uh, the, your various routing protocols. So pretty slick setup. Okay. So last chance. Any questions? Well, I think we'll go ahead and call that. Everybody have a happy new year, and we will see you back here next month. Thank you for attending.